Okay, in this discussion, we are going to talk about the factors affecting satisfaction and commitment on the job and why is it important to work on or to build job satisfaction and commitment among your employees. Okay, so why is it important to build on job satisfaction and organizational commitment? Okay, and these two, although they are close to each other, they have key differences. When we say job satisfaction, that is more of how happy you are with what you're doing. While on the other hand, when we say organizational commitment, that's the extent to which you feel embedded towards your company. So some people may be happy with what they're doing, but they do not necessarily feel at home with their company. So that's high job satisfaction, but low or average commitment. On the other hand, there are people who are not so happy or satisfied with what they're doing, but because their company is very um, welcoming or very, um, you know, they're, they have good relationship with their workers, they are committed to their company. Okay, so I think the most ideal situation here is when you have high job satisfaction and high organizational commitment at the same time. So let's define them. When we say job satisfaction, that is the attitude employees have towards their job. So basically, low, medium, um, low average or high satisfaction. Are you unhappy, neutral, or happy towards your job? Okay, because job satisfaction may fluctuate from time to time or it may fluctuate from one employee to another. So it's important that you remain happy or satisfied with what you're doing. And there are a lot of factors affecting job satisfaction. For example, if you have been working in the same position for quite some time, then eventually you will get bored with what you're doing. Then you will no longer find fulfillment in what you're trying to do. Hence, your job satisfaction tend to decline. That's why we have um, we discussed in the theory of motivation that when people look for new stimulation, we can provide that in the company by allowing them to undergo job rotation, like what I told you in training, or allowing them to have more freedom with their jobs, allowing them to have more control, to recognize their input, or promoting them may also help from time to time. Okay, and then next, let's talk about organizational commitment or the extent to which an employee identifies with and is involved in an organization. So there are employees who may be happy with their job, but they will not join the company when it comes to their organizational mission. They do not cooperate that much. They just do what they have to do, but they will not go beyond their jobs so that may happen as well while people with organizational commitment they go beyond the requirement of the job like they might do things that is not part of their job um, in the first place like they may help in they may launch a campaign or it may be even ev it, it's even evident in the day-to-day -day behaviors like people with high organizational commitment they make sure that other people are doing well they have good relationships with their boss, with their co-workers, with their peers. They help in doing tasks um, such as um, tasks that are not part of their job, such as helping in maintaining the meeting room organized, helping their co-workers figure out their way through something difficult, um, assisting others even though um, their assistance is not required. So those are the different ways to see that a person is committed to his or her organization. So let's say, for example, in the case of freelancers or those who are not tied to a certain organization, perhaps they're doing what they do, but they won't go beyond what is expected out of them. Okay, because they are more satisfied, they are more satisfied with what they're doing than committed to a certain organization. Okay, so these are the different factors that we can consider and these two are not on the same level at the same time okay so let's take a look at this um, theoretical model that is being presented right now and see how the satisfaction commitment relate to other factors so first let's take a look at the 
antecedents or what are the factors that we must consider before looking at satisfaction and commitment and what are they first individual predisposition so there are certain personality factors that may affect one's satisfaction and commitment in my experience people with higher commitment tend to be those people with higher consensuousness because if you have high consensuousness then you're more likely to go beyond what is required of your position so say for example i can say that a student is committed to his or her university when i ask um, when i ask for volunteers typically these students will be the ones who will volunteer like they will uh, they will be interested in 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 joining a campaign or joining a university movement so those are the consensual individuals and there are other um, individual factors or traits that may that may predict satisfaction and commitment other than consensuousness okay and then next life satisfaction or in the science of well-being satisfaction of with life is related to subjective well-being or happiness so this life satisfaction may be on the job or outside the job so what this model is telling us is that people who are happy with their job or with their personal life tend to be happier with their jobs or they tend to be more satisfied or more committed in the organization okay other than that we also have job expectations so let's see if your expectations will match what you're actually doing say for example i've had a colleague before where in his expectations about his job would be um, something related to human resources but when he started working what he's doing is not actually related to human resources but more of marketing but his position is human resources associate so his expectation does not match with what is actually being done in the job hence we can expect a lower satisfaction and commitment organizational fit do your personal values match with the values of your company okay so if you value um, if your company values research okay and you also value research personally then we can expect that you're more likely to be satisfied and committed in that position perception of fairness so we're going to talk about organizational justice later so if there is bias or unfair discrimination in your company then we can expect lower satisfaction and commitment and the other way around and of course good co-workers for good relationship there uh, they also play an important factor of course i know that there are cases where in a certain person will resign because of a certain annoying co-worker that may happen and of course the stressors okay do your company help you with the stressors that you're feeling or is your company the the main reason why you're stressed right now and finally the job itself do you think that what you're doing is fulfilling okay how do you see yourself years from now do you see yourself doing the same thing years from now will you remain in teaching years from now or will you try something else so that is those are the possible antecedents and these antecedents will result will result to certain consequences however the relationship is not direct because there is a mediator that satisfaction commitment meaning before satisfaction with life result to performance satisfaction and commitment with the job and satisfaction with the job and commitment to the company will enter the equation first okay so let's connect the dots here for example those who are happy with their personal life are more likely to be happy with their job and committed to their company hence they will perform well so it's called a mediator okay other than that those who are committed and satisfied are more likely to have lower turnovers they are more likely to be always be present and avoid absenteeism and tardiness and we're going to talk about organizational citizenship later to what extent do you identify with your company as a part of your company okay do you work and go or do you work and when you work do you feel that you're a part of your company okay do you to what extent do you uphold the mission the vision the goals of your company okay and of course if you are committed to your job then we can expect lesser counterproductive behaviors what are the counterproductive behaviors such as um using your sick leaves even though you're not sick 
Um, other counterproductive behaviors may include stealing, gossiping, rumors um, that are disruptive, and other types of disruptive behaviors. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about in the model that we discussed earlier is the types of commitment, okay? So there are different types of commitment that you can show towards your jobs and they are not they're um they are actually distinct with each other the first is what we call affective commitment when we say affective commitment that is the extent to which an employee wants to remain with an organization and cares about the organization so if you display affective commitment it only means that you stay because you love your company or you stay because you love your job okay say for example you decided to stay on the university where you study because you love your course you love your um you love your program and you love your university okay you so you're proud of your school okay so that's effective commitment the same goes for the job if you are embedded to what you're doing and you're happy with what you're doing then we can expect that you'll be proud about your work and you will go beyond your work requirements that is effective commitment so i hope that there are um, a lot of people who are experiencing effective commitment right now because most of the time people display what we call continuous commitment okay so when we say continuous commitment this is the extent to which employees believe that they must remain in an organization due to the time expense and effort that they have already put into the organization so when we say continuous commitment guys it means that you remain not because you're happy with your company but rather you remain because of time it means that I've been working here for 10 years, so that's why I don't want to leave because my efforts for the past 10 years would be wasted. Expense. I have spent a lot as a manager when it comes to improving the company. I even spend from my own wallet. That's why I don't want to leave because if I leave, then I won't be able to, to experience, I won't be able to make the most out of my um, out of my contributions okay and effort i tried my best for the past 10 years to be promoted in this company so don't expect that i'm leaving anytime soon okay so with continuous commitment they are remaining but we're not necessarily saying that they're happy that they remain okay they're just remaining because they have invested a lot of themselves to the organization and they won't they're not um they're not comfortable about the idea of leaving immediately because if they leave immediately then it means that most of their efforts would go to waste another definition of continuance commitment that is not in this slide is that continuance commitment refers to the type of commitment that you give towards your company if it's hard to find another job so there are situations we're in because of high unemployment rates and um, the scarcity of opportunities in a certain country employees may decide to stay because it's hard to find another job so they stay not because they're happy but because it's the only opportunity available so i hope that you can see how it differs with effective commitment or the people who stay because they love what they're doing and finally we have here what we call normative commitment so when we say normative commitment that is the extent to which you if you feel that you have the obligation to remain with your organization so normative is it more similar to effective or more similar to continuance actually it's more similar to continuance so continuance and normative sometimes they may um they may be felt by a single person at the same time but there's an important difference in continuance commitment you don't want to leave because you have invested a lot to the company but in normative commitment you don't want to leave because you feel obliged to remain why because your organization has spent a lot on you okay or has invested a lot in you as, a, as their employee say for example you were considered the quote unquote the star or the prodigy in your company okay so they trained you abroad they gave you opportunities that's why right now you realize that you have a lot of potential 
you can work somewhere else with your skills, but you don't want to leave because you would say, quote and unquote, this is my first job. And then they trained me, they helped me get to where I am right now. Hence, I would not leave. It would be my obligation to return um to return what they have invested on me by working harder and by staying. So they're not necessarily happy with what they're doing. They just remain because they feel that they need to because their company has invested a lot um, to them. Okay. So among the three effective continuance and normative, which of them leads to job satisfaction? Research would say it's effective commitment. While with continuance and normative, most of the time, their job satisfaction is either average or low. So I hope that you can cultivate effective commitment. May it be in your school or in your company. Another factor that may influence your job satisfaction is discussed in the social information processing theory. So the title of this theory may sound a little bit um, complex. However, the the premises of this theory is easy to comprehend. So it says that employees model their levels of satisfaction and motivation from other employees. Or in simple terms, if other people are happy, then you're more likely to be happy. If other people do nothing but complain about their jobs, then we can expect that you're also going to complain about your jobs. That's why it's important that um, that's why I told you earlier that co-workers play a big role in shaping your job satisfaction because sometimes you don't realize that if you're surrounded by people who do nothing but complain, then you're also going to complain a lot about your job even though what you're doing is actually fulfilling. Okay, That's why it's a blessing if you are surrounded by people who tend to look at the positive side about the job or who will remain satisfied or committed to their job because you tend to model these things and if you're exposed to people who radiate positive energy then you're more likely to experience that positive energy and fulfillment with your job as well okay that's how our co-workers play an important role in shaping our job satisfaction and more importantly of course it's important to see that your superiors are satisfied with their jobs. So if your co-workers or your managers, your supervisor do nothing but tell you to expect negative things will happen while on the job, then I would guess that months from now, you will end up being dissatisfied with your work. Okay, so it's important to see. Um, that people are enthusiastic about their job because you tend to embody those experiences as well. Another thing that we talked about in the model earlier that predicts job satisfaction and organizational commitment is what we call organizational justice or the perceived fairness in the institution or your company. So an when we say organizational justice, it has three um, types which are distributive, um, distributive, procedural, and interactional. When we say distributive justice, this is the perceived fairness in the decisions made in, orga in an organization. So an example of distributive justice is this. So person A got fired because of a violation. Is it right to fire person A? Because person B did uh, have the same violation, but he was not fired. So in distributive justice, you are questioning the decision. So a new employee got promoted, but another employee who was there for a longer time wasn't promoted. So in distributive justice, you are questioning if there is fairness in the decisions made by the executives. Okay, And the more um, bias there is in an organization, then the lower your job satisfaction and commitment will be. Because there's no sense in committing yourself to an organization who only, um, who, what's this, implements selective justice. They only give justice to people who are close to the boss or, or people who are in the inner circle, then 
that's not um there's no justice at all for the people who are not considered to be part of the inner circle after that connected to distributive justice what we call procedural justice or the perceived fairness in the methods in arriving at a decision so if the question if the one being questioned in distributive is the actual decision or the what in the procedural justice you're questioning the how okay so you've heard that person a got fired because he or she um quote and unquote st stole something from the manager's office okay so now what you're questioning is how were they able to prove that he stole something how were they able to prove the, how were they able to arrive at the decision that he needs to get fired if our manual employee manual or our employee handbook says that the punishment for stealing is um, one month suspension so with procedural justice you're questioning how did they arrive to that decision is the decision fair what are the methods um, that was used to arrive at that decision was there due process okay so person a was promoted what were the criteria used in promoting the person um, we passed a student A. What was the grading system? So that's procedural justice. And next, when we say interactional justice, the perceived fairness in the interpersonal treatment that employees receive in an, or in an organization. So you don't want to have selective justice. You know that there is interactional injustice if one person got punished while the other did not get punished why because the person who did not get punished he was actually part of the inner circle of the boss he or she was the best friend of the boss in the company so there is interactional injustice of course you'd want to have a company that will treat its employees and subordinates fairly for you to be committed or for you to be happy with what you are doing okay and the more you get exposed to biases or injustice in your company the less committed you become okay and you have the tendency to look for another company another factor that may influence job satisfaction and organizational commitment is the presence of a chance for growth and challenge in your organization just like what i told you before if you've been doing the same thing for quite some time then there's a tendency for you to get bored with what you're doing hence you're looking for a more challenging task or something new to learn okay and we can see those things here in this slide and how does this opportunity to learn affect us first there is a phenomenon called um, job enlargement wherein in job enlargement what your company asks you to do is you're given more tasks to perform at the same time so in other words with job enlargement we are adding new tasks to your job description so at first it may look terrifying because from now on you have to do more things but actually in the long run if done in the right way this would lead to higher job satisfaction so in my case as a teacher it was out of my comfort zone to conduct online classes i hated i despised online classes before but because of the job enlargement that is happening right now it is part of our job to um, enhance our online classrooms at first it was terrifying but eventually i began to embrace the idea and i look at it as a new challenge that will allow me to grow and then after this experience i can confidently say that i am experienced enough to handle an online classroom so that's what job enlargement is you will do more tasks as part of your job okay and on the other hand when we say job enrichment this differs with enlargement because in enlargement you're just given more tasks but with job enrichment you're given more responsibility over those tasks given to you and high and you are given more responsibility to decide so it means that in simple terms when we enrich a certain position we're also empowering that person or we do allow that person to decide it means that 
the manager or the supervisor may have lesser control over the job because they trust the employee enough they allow him or her to decide on his own so going back to my example an example of a job that is highly enriched is the job of teaching because when you teach most of the time your supervisors are not there to monitor what you teach so you are given freedom to execute what you want to do okay and when you give freedom to your employees they do not feel micromanaged they don't feel that they are controlled all the time that brings happiness that they can bring something to the table okay so that is it for job enrichment and enlargement so what do these um, what do these processes do to help us grow so I already told you about job rotation and now you learn about job enlargement and job enrichment what they do is that they attempt our self actualization needs remember Maslow's theory so this is the role of these three of job rotation enlargement and enrichment they allow us to actualize by allowing us to become better individuals because remember what do self actualizers do they have full use of their talents and their um, they are in their full potential so in order for you to be more talented and to use that talent and to be a better person then it's recommended that at some point in your life you experience either of the three enlargement enrichment and job um, enri um, enlargement okay so these three will help you in becoming a better employee, in growing and facing more challenging tasks. Now let's take a look at the other side of the equation. So what happens if your employees are not happy with what they're doing? So here are, they won't necessarily tell you that they're unhappy with their jobs or they want to leave your company, but you can observe their um, lack of commitment and lack of job satisfaction through the following. The first is absenteeism. So if people are no longer enthusiastic about what they're doing, then expect that they're more likely to be absent or to be tardy with their jobs. Okay, so now what we can do to address absenteeism is for us to reward good attendance. And here are the different existing ways to reward good attendance. Under financial bonus, we do have what we call well pay or in the US setting. I don't know if this happens in the Eastern setting. I rarely hear something that is related to this. Okay, but anyway, I'll discuss it. Well pay is what happens when you don't use your sick leave, they get converted into cash. So you're motivated to, to stay healthy. Okay, and to be present most of the time because you know that if I have a lot of unused sick leaves, then these sick leaves will be converted into cash and then I'm going to save something by the end of the year. Other than that, why don't we can also give financial bonus or um, bonuses, cash bonus to those who have good attendance. And we also have what we call business games. And I think that not all of you are familiar with this because this is a very Western um, reward for, for good attendance. And what business games is, or games such as poker, bingo, raffle, and other games wherein if you win those games, you will have a reward. So typically, the contestants in these games are those with good attendance. So in order for you to play the game, you, have, you should have good attendance. And if you have good attendance, you can join the game and you will be rewarded for doing so. Like what if the, the price in the raffle would be... Um, um, a big incentive or a new cell phone so that's very very rewarding and lastly we have what we call paid time off okay so in the western setting they have a policy where in if you don't use your sick leaves your vacation days your holidays what they can do is combine all of these and then you can take a leave say for example one month or three months okay and here in the philippine setting what we do have is what is called sabbatical leave so if a certain professor or employee has been teaching or working for quite some time and they want to try something else they can have a sabbatical leave they can explore somewhere else okay or they can take their time off for quite some time they if they won't teach for a semester okay if they may not teach for a year so that they can take some time um, with their family so that's um, under sabbatical leave or in the western setting called paid time off program okay so other than that here are other things we can do to reduce absenteeism of course there should be um 
consequences for absenteeism and these consequences must be understood by the employee why is he or she being punished punished he or she should know that the punishment is because of bad attendance next is clear policies and better record keeping so don't expect that you will be able to punish absenteeism if you are not recording attendance okay if you're very lenient with your attendance then how are people supposed to take your rules seriously the next is increasing attendance by reducing employee stress that is an indirect way okay to reduce absenteeism of course if they're happy with what they're doing if they're not that stressed then expect that they will be um, present most of the time and another indirect way of reducing absenteeism is by reducing illness how are you monitoring the health of your employees both physically and mentally so do you have an um do you have a doctor who is on call in your clinic or do you have a psychologist who can attend to the mental health needs okay and also you can reduce absenteeism by not hiring absence prone employees so you can um, get information about the attendance of these applicants by asking for their reference um, reference providers like their old boss their old mentors how is the attendance of this person and so those are the things that you can do to, to reduce absenteeism in your company and not all of them may be effective okay some of them are direct interventions while the others tend to be indirect interventions okay and another another way to see that people are no longer satisfied or happy with what they're doing is with turnover or the intention to leave the company or to resign the co resign from the company okay so in order for you to reduce turnover so here's the recommendation by our author the first step to reduce turnover is to find out why your employees are leaving okay so this is done by administering attitude surveys to so employees and conducting exit interviews because there are instances where in you no longer ask for their reasons why they're leaving that's why you cannot pinpoint what's the problem with your company or maybe there's no problem with your company there is a problem with your employee so you need to know what is the reason why they are leaving okay and here are the typical reasons for turnover unavoidable reasons why if what if your employee needs to transfer somewhere else what if there are some instances wherein that employee don't feel happy anymore with what he or she is doing or there may be concerns in the family or in some instances advancement what if there's no growth in your company anymore so don't expect that he or she is going to stay in that camp company and next we also have unmet needs psychological or physical so what if their psychological needs are not being unmet like there are hot your co-workers are not that friendly there's no growth there is no actualization there is no safety in your company and there an employee may also escape from the situation spe specifically if the boss or the co-workers are you know they are not that good um it's not easy to work with them okay they are there are annoying co-workers or there are annoying bosses and the employee decided to to escape from the situation by resigning or unmet expectations like what I told you earlier your position is human resources but what you're doing is marketing then how would how are you supposed to remain um, in that job okay so that's those are the things you can do to deal with turnover okay and other things that you can do to avoid turnover is to create realistic job previews and i told you about realistic job previews in the in the selection process so you need to give them an idea early during the selection phase about what is going to happen on the job itself maybe their expectation will not match with the actual with the actual job okay so in order for you to reduce absenteeism give them a concrete idea of what is going to be expected if they are on the job okay so other than that select employees who have been referred by current employee who have been who have friends or family working for the organization and who do not leave their previous job after only a short tenure so those are things to remember okay remember to select referred employees or applicants referred by those um, employees 
who are good performers because good employees will also refer good applicants. On the other hand, bad employees will refer terrible applicants. So their referral may not be the best refer referral for your company. And then meet employee needs, of course. May that be physical or psychological. Make sure that their um, needs are being met. They're being satisfied, okay? They have good co-workers. There's growth, there's opportunity, and there's a chance to become a better worker. And the chance for and if those needs are fulfilled, then expect that they can be happy with what they're doing. They're going to be committed to your company. And after that, mediate conflict, conflicts between employees and their peer supervisors and customers. So as a boss, it's your job to be the mediator during conflicts. Because most of the time, if you let, um, if you let employees resolve conflicts on their own, that conflict may not be resolved. It may end up on a um, greater conflict between your employees. Okay, so they may end up not having a good team chemistry or they may end up ignoring each other. So that's not good for your company. Other than that, provide good working environment, provide competitive pay and benefits package, and provide opportunities to advance and grow. And I've explained this one already. So those are other things you can do to avoid turnover in your company. Another sign that an employee has a low job satisfaction or low organizational commitment is the absence of what we call organizational citizenship behaviors. So what is an what are OCBs? OCBs are behaviors such as helping others or staying late on the job or helping with the helping the committee to prepare for a program even though that's not part of your job going beyond your task duties and responsibilities because you love your company so those are ocbs and ocbs are behaviors that are not part of an employee's job but that make um, the organization a better place to work okay so these behaviors are going to be displayed by those who are happy and committed to their company so you can see who among your employees are committed by looking at the employees who do or who avoid ocbs okay so i hope that if you're working somewhere right now your you can see organizational citizenship behaviors from your co-workers if there's a lack of ocb then there might be um, low job satisfaction in your company and low organizational commitment. So basically, that is it for our discussion in job satisfaction and organizational commitment. I hope that you learned that we, you must give value to the needs of your employees. Otherwise, they won't, they won't exert effort in their jobs. They won't be happy. They won't be committed to your company. Because at the end of the day, you do not want your employees to just... Um, be committed in one day you want them to have a commitment to your company for a long term okay you don't want them to just just to gain experience you want them to contribute for a long for a long period of time to your company and you won't be able to do that if your organization will not provide the needs of your workers okay so that is it for job satisfaction and organizational commitment two related but, but distinct um, psychological phenomenon that must be observed in any company that you go to. So that's it and thank you for listening to this discussion.